Thank you for joining us for another power-packed message from Dr. Miles Monroe, provided by Monroe Global Incorporated and MonroeGlobal.com. We transform followers into leaders and leaders into agents of change. We hope that this message is a blessing to you as you advance your life and discover your purpose. Now, let's go into the message. I'm calling this a mentoring moment because this is the kind of things that a mentor would share with mentees. But because you all are so special to me, I'm going to share with all of y'all, okay? Uh, how to do something like this. I want to, first of all, talk to you a little bit about why you need to write. Uh, and how myself, I had to overcome uh, the mentality of an oppressed person. It's very rare for an oppressed person, historically, to feel confident enough to document their ideas. And the reason is because oppression takes away from you your self-worth. So you feel like you're not worth anything. That spills over into your thoughts. If you're not worth anything, then your thoughts are not worth anything. Your ideas are not important. And so you, your conclusion is, and I'm showing you these pictures because I've written, uh, there's over 67 books that I've written. We count about 57 of them because the extras are manuals that I wrote. But these are some of the languages we are in. This is in Afrikaans. Uh, this is in Italian. We have 62 languages now. And my, that's important because your books are able to be universally transferred. <clears throat> and I'll talk a little bit about that. <clears throat> this is uh, Spanish. Uh, our largest market right now for, for books are Spanish-speaking people, which is exciting to me. And uh, we have also here uh, Portuguese. And so we have books in all these different languages. <clears throat> Now, one of the reasons why you yourself have not felt confident enough to write a book is because of your past. Who wants to listen to you? <clears throat> Who wants to read what you think? And that spirit comes from your past. We always think that other people should write. I grew up with an even more difficult mentality, and that is, only the oppressor could write a book. Um, all the books that we were <clears throat> given access to growing up as a kid were written by Europeans. Uh, all the characters in those books for children had names like Mary and Jane and John. And the names didn't register to us because we didn't have those kind of names. And the stories were, you know, Mary had a little dog, and the dog had a name, and then they would clean the dog and feed the dog. And the stories about kids, you know, having a puppy that was a good puppy. And we didn't have no poodles to play with. We were poor. So even the stories didn't make sense to us. Then there was a book that came into my life as a kid, and all of us had to read it in school. And the book was called Topsy. Topsy was a story about uh, a black boy and girl that fell out of the sky. And they had, you know, the drawings of two black kids falling out of the sky. And the story was about these two kids who came out of nowhere. Interesting story. And that, that left an impression on my mind. And I didn't understand the purpose for the, story, for the story until a little later. The story was intent to explain to us, as black kids, that we didn't come from nowhere. We just fell out of the sky. Keep in mind now, you know, the, the, the colonial oppressors, uh, they cut us off from our heritage in Africa. So, they didn't want you to even know you came from anywhere. 
Because where there is no history and heritage, there's no value. And that was four years old, five years old, that was the book all kids had to read. You came from the sky. I bring that up because I want to show you how powerful books are. They are ideas containers. A book is an idea container. It, it transmits ideas. And I want to begin to talk from that perspective. <clears throat> One of the things I thought was interesting too is that the oppressor made sure that your parents could not read. That's because books contain ideas. And the goal was you maintain oppression by the maintenance of ignorance. Remember that the word knowledge in Hebrew is the same word as light. Light. The word in the Hebrew for ignorance is the word darkness. So, if you want to keep a person in the dark, you make sure they never get light. Light is what? Knowledge. Knowledge. So the way you maintain oppression is you maintain darkness. So you've heard this said before, if you want to hide something from someone, you put it in a book. Uh -huh. That is true, because if having a book is useless if you cannot read it. So writing a book is not just writing a book. It's the transmission of light. I have received, I guess by now, maybe, I don't know, a million, over a million responses to my books. I could say that for sure, maybe two million, but I, I'll just say a million. We have people have written me from countries I've never been to in places that I have never seen with my eyes. And they have written me and said, your book changed my life. Um, so I'm about to talk to you about one of the most important things in the world, the transmission of light. God told Moses when he encountered God. He said, Moses, I want you to do some things for me. And Moses he finally agreed. And then God told Moses, when the people came out, he says, write. That's in the Bible. God said, Moses, I want you to write these things down. That's how powerful writing is. So Moses took God's ideas and put them on a parchment. I say parchment because Moses grew up in Egypt. You all remember that as a young man. He grew up in Egypt. Egypt was the first civilization to create paper. I want to show you how smart God is about writing. So God made sure that Moses did not grow up with his people. He made sure he grew up in the civilization that invented paper. The papyrus reed, they call it. And Moses learned at the University of Egypt. He went, they, they had the first university, Egypt, Egyptians. So Moses not only went to a, a, the highest civilization of his day, but he grew up in the king's court as a prince, went to the top university and that was the only civilization that invented paper. God was preparing this man, even as a teenager, to write. The first five books of the Bible are the most important books in the Bible, and they were written by Moses. And Moses wrote them on paper. Remember, he came out of Egypt. That's how important writing is. And God gave Moses the most important information to write, the creation narrative. 
That's how you know where you came from. Moses wrote the ideas. So writing is the most powerful contribution you can make, not just to your generation, but all the generations after you die. Let me explain how that works. Why write and publish a book? Number one, because the world is ruled by dead men. Now, why do I say that? Everything that we believe today, we got it from somebody who's dead. How? They left their ideas on paper. As a matter of fact, America is actually ruled and governed by dead men. Who really rules America? Plato, Socrates, Aristotle. They rule America now. How? They're the ones who wrote the ideas about democracy over 2,500 years ago. And those ideas are ruling your country. The point is, they wrote. They died, and their ideas outlived them. So when you write, you are doing something very dangerous. You are leaving ideas that will outlive you in the cemetery. And they will affect generations after you. In essence, writing makes you live forever on Earth. So learning how to write and learning what to write and learning why you should write is really the most powerful act you can perform to guarantee life after death. Now let me just say something also, and I'm speaking specifically to some of you who are from a unique background. Um, I also, my conviction, my personal experience in writing, you know, I fought this for a long time. I mean, you know, I remember the first time someone asked me to write my ideas. I fought it. I, I, and the guy was a publisher, you know, and he tried to convince me. I said, are you crazy? I said, no one wants to read what I have to say. And plus, I don't know how to write. I don't know how to start. I don't know anything about this. And plus, you know, only smart people write books. And, and, and I fought that thing. I was speaking at a conference in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And you never know who's in a crowd, you know, when you're speaking. And there was a publisher there. And I was speaking on a just subject on relationships and singleness. And the guy walks up to me and he says, I have never heard that information before. He said, that's a fresh idea about the subject of singleness and marriage. I said, thank you very much. He says, have you ever thought of writing that? I said, no. <laughs> no one wants to. I don't, I, don't, I don't know. I can't write a book. And no one wants to read what I have to say. Only smart people write books. He said, you don't understand. What you said today could change millions of lives. I said, no. That's just a little teaching I have. And he tried to convince me, and I asked. And I asked him to leave. I said, look, just get away from me, because I, you know, I can't write. I don't want to write. And you know, only certain types of people write, and not people like me. And he said, you don't understand. You are obligated to write these ideas. You've got to help people with this. He said, the audience you had are the only ones who know what you said. I said, no, that's impossible, man. I hit me, right? Not a writer. I went back to the hotel room, couldn't sleep that night. I had a restless Holy Ghost night. Yeah. It's one of them nights when the Lord just says, Look, you ain't gonna, I ain't going to sleep, you ain't going to sleep. Yeah. I don't slumber nor sleep this night, you ain't going to slumber nor sleep. I have was harassed by the Holy Spirit. And I can't tell you all that he said, but it was a deep night. And that's when I really was revealed the idea about the cemetery during that night. 
when the Lord says, if you die today, everything you know would go to the cemetery. He says, you will be a generational thief. Whoa. Wow. It was a rough night. That's rough. That's rough. That's rough. And then he said to me, he said, if you don't write and record your history and your experience in life, somebody else will write your history for you. And he said, that has been your curse <clears throat> as a black man. Other people have been writing your history from their perspective. Man, I woke up sweating. <laughs> Do you know what's really our problem? Other people write for us and they don't know us. And they normally write history from what they want history to tell. They don't know the truth about you. And if you don't write, somebody else can write for you, and they will not write the truth. So I decided that day, I called the guy the next morning, I said, I gotta have breakfast with you. He came to the hotel, we sat down. I said, okay, I give up. I write. <laughs> he said, thank you so much, because I couldn't sleep either. And that breakfast was an important breakfast. We sat there, didn't eat anything. And he said, look, this is going to be simple. Give me all the, see, all the, the cassette tapes, back then's cassette tapes. Give me all the cassette tapes on this subject you have. Just send them to me. I said, that's all? He said, that's it. Just send, them, send me the cassette tapes. So I went home to the Bahamas. I told the folks there to get all the cassette tapes on the subject, put it in the package, we mailed it to him. And in three weeks, <coughs> he sent me back a manuscript. I'd never seen that before. And I'm, I'm thinking, I didn't write anything. And he said, I want you to read the manuscript, go through it, correct, revise, edit, take out, inject, add, subtract, whatever you need to do to make this you. So I went through this manuscript. I was so, I was feeling so good, you know, like my thoughts are on paper. So I went through it, sent it back. Then he sent back <clears throat> another two weeks, the manuscript, and this time it was paginated, you know, in the form of like a book form. Oh, I felt real good. I said, I'm looking, I look like a book. I was so excited. I revised it again, did some editing, sent it back to him. And he said, OK, uh, if you're satisfied, we are satisfied, let's go. And my first book was published. 1990. The thoughts that I had in that book were thoughts I was teaching my small group of people in the Bahamas for years. For years, you know, the same the subject, because you know, I was doing a lot of stuff on marriage, and, and I had no idea that these ideas were so important for people outside of my little group. The book was published, and uh, he said, now, no one knows you. So, you know, no bookstore can carry a book, and no one knows you. You're not, a, you know, you're not a known person, an author, or anything. He said, so we need to, he said, your ideas are important, but you need some credibility. So he said, uh, is there anyone that you know that you can ask to do the foreword for you so we can put their name on the book? Someone who is well known. I said, oh, I don't know anyone, you know. And I was, a, you know, uh, I was a student of Oral Roberts University, I graduated in 1980. And so this was, you know, years later, 19, 10 years after I graduated. He said, what about Oral Roberts? I said, no, man, Oral Roberts is a oh, man of God, patriarch, great evangelist of the world. He would never think of, you know, doing a forward for a young black guy from an island in the ocean somewhere. You know, this guy, this is a big man who built a university, ain't got time for me. He said, look, 
I understand that, you know, he likes you. I said, yeah, you know, he's my father, he's one of my mentors. And he said, just ask him. I said, he'll never do that. Oh, Robert's name is so powerful, he won't give it to a young black boy. He said, just send it to him and ask him. So he sent me a copy of the manuscript. I put it in a bag and I dropped it off when I was in Tulsa at the office of Dr. Al Roberts. I was there for a meeting and within 24 hours, his secretary called me back at the hotel and says, uh, she said, Miles, uh, Dr. Al Roberts wants to talk to you. I'm thinking now he gonna tell me, you know, this is foolishness. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? Are you nuts? And he came on the phone, he says, my son, Miles, yeah. He said, this is good work. Oh, I breathe. <laughs> he said, matter of fact, this is exceptional. And no one has written on this subject before that I know of. I'll be happy to put my name to this. He said, I read the first two chapters. This is outstanding. I will be happy to do your forward. Jesus. Where do you want me to send it? Mm -hmm. I said, I'll pick it up. <laughs> <laughs> and the phone was written that day. I went, picked it up, and if you look on my book on the table back there, on singles, married, and separate life after divorce, all robbers did the forward for that book. <laughs> now, the publisher did something interesting. So we, we, we have his name and his endorsement. So he put his name large on the back of the book. In the title, and he put all robbers and bottom Miles Monroe, real small. <laughs> Wisdom. Yes, because all the bookstores were buying all robbers' books. So when he did that, then he sent out, you know, and I'll tell you a little bit how they do this. You know, they shoot this thing out to all the suppliers and all the publishing distributors, and they sent like a little, you know, sample to everybody. And when they saw all robbers' name, everybody, all the bookstores says, hey, all robbers wrote another book. But it was not Robert's book, it was my book. <laughs> so they, but they saw the name and they started ordering the book. And then they reviewed it, of course. They have these people who actually review your books and they say, well, if all Robert's endorsed it, then it must be of his standard. So we'll sell it. Oh. <laughs> I'm thinking, you know, I'm going to sell maybe, you know, 200 books. We sold half a million. Uh, when I got my first royalty check, <laughs> I decided I won't write books. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how I began to write. I had to fight it first, and the Lord had to beat me real good. He said, if you do not write all that I have taught you, you are a thief to the next generation. And if you don't write, you will take everything to the cemetery. If you're 30 years old today, you get 30 years of history that the cemetery could get. You learned something in 30 years. And the unborn children need to know what you learned. If you're 30. Ideas outlive men. Secondly, printed ideas outlive generations. Printed ideas. Now, the reason why I also refer to books more than electronic recordings is because electronic recordings could actually be burned up. They could be destroyed. It's difficult to destroy a book. I'm, you know, I'm, many of you may be looking at companies like Amazon and, you know, uh, Apple and, and these folks are digi digitizing the books. Mm -hmm. They will never replace books. That's right. Right. Mm, yeah. <laughs> there are seven billion people on earth and only maybe 800 million have iPads. Wow. So six billion people can't get to a Kindle but they can buy a paperback book. Yes. Yes. 
I have gone into countries where I was thinking, no one knows me here. My wife and I was in a little town in, in uh, Greece. We went to the Mediterranean. And we were walking in you know, a little private vacation. And we up in the hills in this beautiful little town called Sonteria, something like that, Sonteria. So everything painted white up there. You know? And to get up there, you need a cable car to get to, the, to this town. I mean, up in the mountains where only goats live. <laughs> and we, up, and we up there, we walk into this little, little town, you know, we shop in the little souvenirs. And this lady shouts out in the store, Miles Monroe. And I'm like, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke you. <laughs> Because I'm trying to get away from people, you know, so I can rest. So we figured we're going to go up way in Greece, you know, up in the mountains where no one knows me. And this lady shouted my name. And I turned around, and there's a, a little stall, you know, they're selling little trinkets. And she says, you must know. I said, yes, ma'am, I don't want to be right now, but I am. And she jumped up and grabbed me and hugged me and kissed through that. And I'm thinking, now, who would know me up here in these mountains? And she says, I'll be right back. And she ran to the little place, came back with one of my books, all mapped up. She says, this, I got your book. I, got, I said, what am I, how did my book get up in the mountains? <laughs> and she had it all marked up. She, she says, I'm sitting there right now, eating my lunch, reading your book. Wow. wow. And God said, see? Wow. To the ends of the earth, a book will take your ideas. Wow. And then she said, I bought this book for my son. And I bought two more for my daughter. Mm -hmm. And I kept thinking, your ideas go to generations, not just for the person who bought it. That's, right. That's why you should write. Also, documented ideas gain in credibility. Now, I know this, sound, this is also negative and positive, OK? It's negative because if the ideas are wrong, they still gain credibility. Right. When you say something, it has a certain amount of substance, of valid, validity. But when you write something, somehow psychologically people think it's true, mm -hmm. even if it's not true. So writing something in a book gives it credibility. Some of the garbage that it's in a bookstore I wouldn't even read. But because it's written, people think it's worthy of buying. Even some of the stuff in Christian bookstores I will not read. It ain't, it ain't got no substance, no content, you know, has no gravity. But because people have printed that thing and you know, put it in a book, people are buying it. So it gives credibility. Also, writing gives you, gives you life beyond your grave. I always remember that no matter how well you did while you were living, if you don't document what you've done, it will die with you. And finally, publishing multiplies the experience of your ideas and the expansion of those ideas and makes them influ influential. And this is very important. Uh, when, you, when you write a book, you you have put it in a form that can multiply its reach. And again, I, you know, I'm speaking from experience. I, I have been to every continent, and my books are there. Uh, my books have now been translated into Ar Ar Arabic, Pakistani, Mandarin. And I'm thinking, I'm, I still live on an island in the Caribbean. Uh, next to the village I was born in, and my books are flooding the Muslim world, the Hindu world, the Buddhist world. It expands you. Some of you in this room have some unique things the world needs to know but it's trapped inside of you. Be, and you don't believe that it's even worth being told. I'll tell you something about writing, too. You never know what's going to happen to your ideas. You just never know. You can be a best-selling author sitting here looking for money. 
I'm talking about trying to pay a light bill and you are a multi-million dollar person because you don't believe your ideas are worth writing. You know that book, The Secret, when it came out, The Secret? That's old ideas. They just repackaged it, <laughs> said it in a, in a different way, <laughs> you know, and God, of course, they put some money behind it, you know, to promote it. Uh, you can actually promote garbage yeah. and people will buy it. Most good ideas never come to the market because they didn't have the right kind of marketing behind them. I'll talk to you about that in a minute, how I had to learn how to manage that. Let's talk a little bit about what qualifies you for writing. If you're going to write, first you need to have experience. I'm not talking about experience in writing. I'm talking about experience in life. Because if you don't have any experience, you ain't got nothing to say yet. So you, you got to have some experience before you could document your ideas. Secondly, you must have a clear idea that is worth writing and documenting. This is a very important point. People come to me and say, Pastor Miles, I want to write a book. I say, okay, that's great. What are you going to write about? I don't know. I got this, you know, couple of thoughts right away. I said to them, don't write. Writing is only going to work if you have an idea that has taken over your life. I'm telling you, you know, people who, you know, write books, all the people, they got these books, and they come to me and say, I'd like to give you one of my books. I look at it and I go, ain't nobody gonna read this. But you know, I'm nice and I take it, you know, take it home, you know, and I give it away to someone else, maybe, you know, to the prison or something. Uh, because the book, has no clear idea. Let me put it another way. And this is number three. You must test and prove that idea. <clears throat> Which means that the idea is something that you have over and over again proven that it is effective in your environment. It helps people, it works, it works for you. You know it's, <clears throat> you know it's, uh, it's effective. Then you can share it. So your idea must be clear and tested. Again, uh, I'm going to say this with a little caution. Every book should only have one idea in it. Okay, I'm saying with a caution because sometimes you know you have two or three to back it up. But there should be one idea in every book. Always remember that, one idea. In other words, when you pick up one of my books, that book has one idea right through the whole book. You know, 300 pages, but believe me, only one idea is in that book. I say a caution because there may be a sub-idea in the book that supports the main idea. Okay. I've seen people give me books or manuscripts to, to, to review for them. And, and really what the manuscript is, is a bunch of sermons that they preached on different subjects. And I'm like, this is not a book. <laughs> it's a collection of sermons. So you call it that. Don't, don't call it a book. Do you understand what I'm saying? So even pastors come to pastors, I want to write a book. I say, okay. And they send me this manuscript, you know, they have a, you know, a, a chapter on, you know, Easter teaching, a chapter on, you know, Christmas teaching, a chapter. And I'm like, this ain't no book. <laughs> a book has one idea. See this book? It has one word on the back. So when you read this book, everything is around that one idea. Everything I know about authority is to treat that. You treat the subject. You treat it. So when the person finished the book, say, "Gosh, I got a handle on authority." Yeah. So you can't have five ideas and then try to put them in a book. It's not a book. They won't sell. Number four, ask yourself the question: Is the idea helpful to the greater market? You may have an idea, but it's really just for you. <laughs> so you got to ask yourself, uh, is, this, is this idea that helped me, that I have experience with, helpful to everybody else that I could talk to? If that answer is yes to that, you're on your way to 
the creation of a book. You know how to, f to fry a certain type of dish very well. You know, you've invented this kind of you know, unique way to fry chicken or whatever. I said, I'm going to write a book on how to fry chicken. Well, I might not be interested in frying chicken. So you spend all your time writing this book on chicken, and no one's interested. It doesn't have the greater market. It's a great idea, but it doesn't, the market ain't interested in your uniquely fried chicken. So you're wasting your time. So it has to be an idea that can help the greater market. And number five, you must research your idea. You must research it. Even though you may be good in handling the idea, you've worked with it, you've taught it, you've ex you know, experienced it, you've developed it, you've cultivated this idea, whatever this idea is, you know, you really have a handle on it, but you really have to therefore expand it further and read other people's ideas on the idea. Do research on it, find out in history, you know, where the idea was used in the past, because there ain't nothing new under the sun. You want to expand your perspective of it by research. Everybody say re, re search. search. You can search, and then you got to back up and re search. <laughs> search it again. That's what research means. You go back and go searching again for it. Because you want your idea to have gravity, it needs to have history. It needs to have validity, and it needs credibility. And that's why you research. <clears throat> I've seen people write books, and they send them to me. And they say, you know, I've got a new revelation. They, they start a book by saying, I got a new revelation. I'm sitting there going, this book is not going to sell. <clears throat> if you start a book with that statement, your book won't sell. You can go to the Christian bookstore right now, and a lot of books start just like that. I was in, you know, God gave me a, revel a new revelation. That's how they start the book. Ain't nobody going to buy your book. Because there ain't nothing new under the sun. It's just simply researched and a new perspective on it, but never new. My books on potential have sold millions. People, you know, my books on purpose have sold millions. I'm not a founder of purpose. I just refound it. <laughs> You know, I, in my experience, I was searching for my life meaning, and I found it in the Word of God, and I said, wow. And then I, it changed my life. I didn't think about writing it. I just was living it. Mm -hmm. And someone says, you need to write that down, because it helped me when I heard you speak it. So I went in and started doing research. Nothing new. Let me put it another way. You can restore an old idea mm -hmm. in your generation. Mm -hmm. It's never new. So don't ever walk around thinking, you know, I got the corn on the market, you know, I got a revelation from God. <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't. You, you know, uh, King Solomon says, there's nothing new under the sun. What has been will be again, and what is will also be again. In other words, don't walk around saying that God gave you a new revelation. No one's going to buy your stuff. You ain't got that kind of credibility. Okay, next question. What should you write? Number one, write your passion. The reason why people find it hard to write is because they don't feel like writing. <laughs> it's that simple. You, you know, you... Here you are trying to, to write, and you sit down with this blank sheet of paper, and for three weeks, you sat down with a blank sheet of paper. And then you say, forget it. Your problem is, you ain't got no passion for what you're trying to write. Write your passion. And by the way, passions change, okay? Uh, for example, then, and that's why you got to almost catch your season. Most of my writings come from the subject that I'm focusing on for that year. Then I write it, because that's my passion at that time. Yeah, 
Your passion gives you energy to keep writing. It, it's the juice that's, that makes you wake up and just suck up that stuff. You, you just want to produce it. You want to get it out. You love this idea. That, you know, that's the juice of writing. If you ain't interested in writing the idea, why should I be interested in reading it? If you're not passionate about it, why should I buy it? Write your passion. Number two, write your experience. If there's something that you experience that is real to you, you know, a young lady came to me, one of my, mentor, my mentees in Florida came to me, and she said, Pastor Miles, I was molested by my father, and I had trauma all these years, etc. but the Lord healed me, and you know, now I'm a wife of a wonderful pastor, and the church is doing great, and, you know, and she was telling me her story, what she went through. And I'm sitting there thinking, this is a book. Because why? If you follow my first slide, this idea would be helpful to millions of people who yes. had the same experience. Yes. And she overcame it. That's the key. Yes. Yes. So I have to write a book. The book is selling, and now the publishing company is interested in it. I assume you know, by the end of next year, she can be a big writer, a big author. But I'd encourage her, I said, look, this is an experience that can help people. Write your experience. And again, your experience is what you're passionate about because it lives with you, right? Right. Yeah, it lives with you. Number three, write your testimony. Again, similar to her experience. If you tested something or you passed a test that other humans are also facing, that is good material for potential writing. Now, for example, do you know why people buy a lot of books on... Um, you know, how to make money, because everybody was broke, right? So here's a guy or a woman who says, look, I had nothing. I started in, you know, sleeping in my car. I sleep in my car. Today, I have a house by the beach. All of a sudden, you're interested, because you slept in cars, too, or you almost did. So that, that testimony is something that people would be interested in. How did you pass that test? That's why you and I like the, the book of Job, you know. We like the book of Job because Job, we, we identify with Job, man. We, all of us lost something. And Job got it back. You want to know, how do you get it back? So we like Job's book. His is a testimony. Fourthly, write your revelation. Now, I want to be cautious with this again because remember I told you, ain't nothing new under the sun. Revelation to me is God renewing an old idea in your mind. That's all it is. It ain't nothing new. It's a renewal of an old idea. Write your revelation. Not everybody will have this perspective. You know, sometimes it isn't revelation, it's an experience you have, or maybe it's a testimony, or it's just a passion. Or for you, it might be a revelation. But, you know, yeah. the different things you can write. That's why I give you this topic, what do you write? The different things you can write. Here's another one. Write your obligation. Now, obligation is a deep one. There are some times in life when a person experiences or discovers something that they must leave to the next generation. That's an obligation you should write. For example, Mr. Andrew Young was here with us last night. <clears throat> he has an obligation to write his experience with the civil rights movement. That's not an option for him. He's obligated. Because these guys are dying. And they're taking history to the cemetery. So people who are like Mr. Nelson Mandela, you know, the long road. Uh, he was obligated to write that. So obligation has to do with, you know, if you have experienced something in life that you owe the next generation, you are obligated to write. And these are normally people who are historical figures who impacted the direction of the world in some, some way. You know, like Bill Gates is probably obligated to write. He's obligated to write his experience in introducing software. He must do it. Um, someone like Brother Ripley, 
is obligated to write. I mean, who have built a place like this, establish, you know, a place like this, give life to this community? This is a lot of work. He should tell this story. He may not think this story is important. But there's a little young guy or a little girl or there's someone in the neighborhood who walks around, looks at this place and goes, I wonder how he did that. He's obligated to tell them. Here's another one. Write your conviction. I want you to think about these things I'm saying. You know, I want you to sit down and think the next couple of weeks. Boy, what is my deep conviction about certain things? For example, you, you may want to write on your deep conviction concerning same-sex marriage. It might be an issue for you that's very deep, and you got some deep thoughts about it and some deep perspectives. And you know, don't be afraid to write it. You have no idea where that book would go. It might change the course of things. If, only if you're convicted about it, though. You just can't say you can write on it and then go try to find information. There has to be a deep conviction. Because the conviction it will, will, make, will make you stay true to the project. Because you might get people attacking you while you're writing it. But if you have deep conviction, you're going to still write it. All right? So that's what you write. Another question, when should you write? Number one, <clears throat> write when there's a demand for your idea. You know, there's some, I remember when the, the publishing company called me when the uh, crisis hit the world, the economic crisis hit the world. And I'm, you know, I was their number one author at that time, and I still am. And they called me. They said, Dr. Munner, do you have anything on crisis? I said, yes, I've been speaking on that this year. Because I saw the crisis coming. And they were so excited. They said, oh, my God. They said, look, we'll, we'll pay you. How much do you want? I said, I'm sending the check. So they send the check. I send them all the material. And there's a book out there called Overcoming Crisis. There was a demand for it. The environment demanded it. So your question should be, is my idea in demand right now? The answer may be yes. In most cases it is, because human life is daily. People experience a lot of things daily. But you've got to make sure that it is relevant to the market. And that leads to number two. When you are competent in your idea is when you should write. Competence, again, has to do with knowing your subject matter. Don't try to write something you don't know about. Don't try to put in on paper what you steal from other people. You know, you need to have an idea that even though you borrowed it, it becomes yours. You worked in it with it long enough that you got your own spin on it. This is, this, this is my piece. That's competence. That means you can't just sit down and say, let me see what I'm right about. Let me see. <laughs> you better go drive a bus. <laughs> no. It has to be something you've been working with for a long time. Some of you may be in nursing, for example. Maybe you're a nurse. You've been a nurse for 20 years. That means you've got 20 years of experience in nursing. To me, that's competence. So you should write a book on a perspective of nursing. And you position it in a way where either it goes only to the medical market or you can position it in a way where it goes to the general market. There are ways you can position it. But the idea, you know your stuff. You were a nurse for 25 years. You know how the, the problems with nursing, the challenges, the, the process, the principles of nursing. You, know, you should write a book. You're competent. When should you write? When you've tested your ideas. Tested means it works. It affects people. It worked for you. You know this works. When should you write? Write when you have proven your idea. When should you write? Write when the market needs your idea. If you have been uh, working with children for a long time, 
you know, you really love children, and this is an area you've been working with for a long time. And let's say unique things, like you've been working with children with disabilities or something. Well, you know, there comes a time when everyone starts talking about that subject. You know, you hear it in the air, you know, people start talking about this stuff, and you go, boy, I'm gonna I'm put my thoughts on paper about this, because the timing is right. People want to know more about this. So the market needs your idea. You can shop that around to a publisher, because the publisher already knows what's in the market too. You know, he, 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 he's looking for ideas. So you gotta study, keep your eyes on the market. I wrote the book on authority. It's already hit the bestsellers list, the USA Today bestsellers list. Uh, I wrote it on, on, uh, because I saw the mess in the world. I saw, you know, leaders falling like flies in both the church and the world, the corporate world and business and politics. It was all because they didn't understand authority. So the Lord says, you got the, con you got the context and the content on this. And this product, this content, this idea, I was teaching 30 years ago. I know this stuff. And then I live it. I built an organization through it. I have the same board with me that's been with me for 34 years. Why? I established authority in the company. So I know I tested it. And I say, okay, the market needs it now. The publisher says, praise the Lord. <laughs> they sell a million copies. They get six million, I get four. So does the market need your idea? If it doesn't need it, it may fall flat. It may be a great idea, but the market says, we're not interested in that right now. Okay. When should you write? You should write when the market is demanding your idea. Right now, people are worrying about what? Employment, right? Money, uh, families falling apart, uh, having to downsize things, maybe, you know, start on business. I was thinking, you know, but Brother Jerome, I mean, I, I don't know, but, you know, he's been interested in, in entrepreneurial stuff. To me, that's the biggest thing right now. If, I, if he was smart, he would write a book on, you know, how to develop your own destiny or something like that. If I, how to, to develop your own financial destiny, how to be free from the system, something like that. You know? And those kind of topics people want to know right now. Oh, yes, please, show me how to get free. And it's not new ideas, it's just packaging it in a way where the people can say, look, there's a book I read and I started my business and I, you know, I lost my job, but look what I did. Man, this book helped me. All of a sudden, because everybody is struggling right now based on the market problems. Is this clear? Yes. Yeah. So you want to study the market to know when to write. There are some subjects that are good all the time. You know, some subjects you can write on them. People, because again, like I said, life is daily. You know, <laughs> so if you write on something like marriage, people always have a marital problem. So, you know, it'll probably work, you know, anytime. Uh, but there are certain times in the market where certain ideas are needed and people will run to it. If you look at the best selling list on Amazon, you'll probably see most of the subjects have to do with the economy or jobs or something. Because the market is saying, look, we need help. So the authors are dumping those ideas in, hoping one of them would hit. Okay? How to write. Now let's get down to the meat. How do you write a book? Number one, you must conceive the idea. Now this may sound simple, but you know, when a woman gets pregnant, she's pregnant. You can't be halfway pregnant, almost pregnant. You're pregnant if you're pregnant, am I right? So when you conceive something, it doesn't go away. So you're going to write a book. You got to actually conceive the book. You have to carry it. It has to be. It's like you know. I got to deliver this thing. I, I, it, that's you know. I got one right now inside of me on character, right? And man, and I'm finishing one on kingdom citizenship. It's going to come out, I think, in January. And I'm just about finishing it right now, doing some cleanup stuff. But I was carrying citizenship all last year. Mm -hmm. I'm delivering it now. But I got character now because I see all this mess in leadership, you know? Mm -hmm. Even your president and other people, you know, this is character issues. And, and I'm thinking, boy, so the publishers are, are, are like bitten bit at the time. Like, Come on, doc, get this one out, man, character. You know, because they know the time is right to hit it. Mm -hmm. With all the immorality in the church mm -hmm. and the corruption in politics and leaders don't know what to do with the Europe. 
These are character defects. And they say, do it. So I got twins. <laughs> right? So you must conceive the idea. And you, you know you conceive an idea when, when you think about it all the time and you keep seeing it from every different perspective. Right? Matter of fact, everywhere you look, you see it again. You, keep, you see it. You got yourself a book. You got to conceive it. And then secondly, you have a, have a concept of the content. Now, when you write a book, the book's supposed to be finished before you start. What do I mean by that? Uh, when you have a book that's ready to be delivered, you actually see the entire book. You ever been, uh, I can't ask one if you've ever been pregnant, but when you're pregnant, you ain't carrying half a baby. You carry the whole baby, right? The whole, there's a whole human in there, whole human. That's what a book is like. You have the whole thing. It's like the idea is complete before you even start to write it. So the concept of the content. Concept means picture. You see the picture of the whole book. You already know how this book is supposed to end. What's the culminating idea? Thirdly, when you have conceived it and you have a picture of the complete book, then you do the big thing that people are afraid of. You write an outline. Now those of you who went to school high school at least, and you, you know, wrote, wrote an essay. I think they might have taught you how to write an outline. Okay, your outline is your introduction, right? Your basic idea, content, your conclusion. That's what you want to do with a book. That's, and the only way to do that is if number two is finished. You have a complete concept, so you can write the whole book. Never begin at the beginning of a book. You begin at the end. At the end, you, that's what God does. God finishes first, then he starts. So you have to make sure you, you, you can see the whole idea finished before you start. That's why you can write the outline. Outline has more to do with like progressive thinking, progression, progression of your idea, developing of the idea. These words are important in outline. You, you know, uh, what, what are you going to say first? How are you going to support it? Uh, what are some of the, the samples, examples you're going to use, or prototypes, or stories, or, you know, kind of lay this thing out. And number four, you complete the research. Again, once you have the outline, then you know what to go look for. It may be your own notes. You start with first things that you've collected over the years. And by the way, let me just say this too. Uh, if you're going to be a, a writer, you've got to be a reader. You know, some of you bought my books. That's wonderful. Read them. And do, do, do you know what, what will happen? Some of my ideas will become yours. And you will end up writing on one or two ideas from my book and do it better than I have done it. Because I, like all authors, authors don't ever finish their ideas. When I say that, I mean, they got so many things going on that almost every chapter is a book. So you may take a chapter and really grab it and it connects to something that you've been doing and you say, man, this, this, this helps to crystallize my ideas. I'm going to write my book on this. And so one of my mentees wrote a book. It came out. This is a beautiful book. One of my young guys, I don't know, he's, in, he's, in, he's not from here. Mm -hmm. And uh, he sent me the manuscript to do the forward for it. Mm -hmm. And it is called Purposeology. Mm -hmm. oh. You all seen that book in the bookstore? It's one of my mentees, Purposeologies. He read my book on purpose, changes life. I mean, just, and he is a, what is he, a psychologist or something? Some, some sophisticated guy. And a smart black guy, I mean, just sharp guy. And he got a degree in doctors and some doctors and something, but he read the purpose book and it changed his life. And now he took, an, he took it to another, um, uh, yeah, he took it to, like, he, he dealt with the science of purpose. And I end up reading the book, and I, I, I got to buy this book myself. <laughs> he took my ideas and doubled it 20 times better. So the market has his book. He researched an idea that he conceived by looking at other ideas that relate to it. So you do research. 
And then you move to the big one. You compose antidotes and examples. Now let me tell you something about writing. People love stories. Say it. People love stories. Some of the most boring books I have ever read are Christian books, so I don't read them anymore. I don't read Christian books. These are boring. My books are not Christian books. These are universal books. They are sold in corporate companies, businesses, politics. They are all over the world. I do not write Christian books. The Christian market is too small for books. 3% of the market is Christians. 3% of the market Christians buy books. You'll die if you write for Christians. Okay. Miles Monroe, book on purpose. Open the book. Neither the judges, this is my introduction now, neither the judges or the audience expected anything from this plain looking middle aged unemployed woman from Scotland who was a contestant on the reality show called Britain's Got Talent in the spring of 2009. That's why I started my book with a story. Uh, you pick up any of my books. It, listen, if you don't catch the reader in the first two sentences, you're going you're gonna to be begging for money. Any book you open on my, any book. I'm going to try to prove what I'm saying to you, okay? Crisis. <clears throat> As I begin, what do you do when everything you trusted in collapses? How do you prepare for a sudden change in life? How do you recover when life hits you on the blind side? After a lifetime of hard work and dedication and commitment and loyalty to a chosen career, how do you suddenly change your vocation and skill sets? Now, what does that do to the reader? I'm so gigantic. Why, you're in the middle of a crisis? And that's what's happening to you. So I got you. The first two sentences of your book, you better get me. Otherwise, you lost me. Another example. Benefits of change. I, I forgot what I did in this. I'll just read it. The book is on change. First sentence. And my sentences are very short at the beginning. Nothing is as permanent as change. Period. That's the first statement of the book. Now, first of all, the sentence is a paradox, right? Mm -hmm. Listen to the words. Nothing is as permanent has changed. It took me days to invent that one statement. I had to capsulize. That one statement is the whole book. So I began the book with one statement and finished it with one statement, if that's what the book is about. That's the preface. You've got to have stories and antidotes. My kingdom books all start with stories. Oh, I describe the world, or oh, I talk about Europe, I talk about the economic problem, I talk about politics. Why? You gotta tell people stories. Don't start out by saying, thus saith the Lord. They ain't gonna buy your book. <laughs> Don't start a book with no scripture. Are you with me? Tell a story. When I wrote my book on uh, In Charge, which was really written for the, the business market, uh, you know, I started that book with a, with a beautiful story. And people actually write me letters about the story. My book on uh, leadership, the spirit of leadership, I get hundreds of letters on the book on the lion. In the story on the lion I told, oh man. And now people are using the story all over the world, you know, using my story. Uh, that's how you get a book to be attractive. Now let me just caution you too. Oh, I don't know if I cover this in the next session, I mean the next segment. But uh, make your, by the way, this is important, if you want to have a successful writing career, make your book universal. What I mean by that is you cannot contextualize your stories and your antidotes to, to your culture. Otherwise, your book will fall flat right in your own house. The only person to read your book will be your mama and your cousin. 
In other words, if you're going to write a book that you want the market to read, you can't use stories or examples that are locked into your culture. When you tell your story, you have to tweak it that it can happen anywhere in the world. Comprende? Yeah. So you can, you know, you can write a book and say, well, you know, uh, uh, you know, whatever. You know, I was in the ghetto, having, you know, buying chicken from uh, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Jones Chicken Shack. You know, listen, ain't nobody know what you're talking about. They don't know Mr. Jones, and they don't know what the shack is. <laughs> you know? So if you, if you read all my books, they they are they are really written in a way that they can land in any country, any context, any language, and the stories I tell are relevant to those people. So when you translate my book into Chinese, you know, Mandarin, Chinese know but lions. Yeah, humans know but lions, and how, you know, so I tell the story about a lion. If you put it in Japanese, you put it in French, everybody knows about lions. I can't tell a story about what happened to me in one town somewhere in the Bahamas, you know, that tell my story, and then start calling names, and from, you know. <laughs> they, they, don't know, they don't know what you're talking about. Are you with me? Yeah. And there are books in the bookstore with that garbage in it. And they wonder why their books ain't selling to no one else except their family. Because I can't relate to your story. I can't relate to your story. The last one is record content. Uh, if you are a public speaker, you are probably better positioned to write a book than people who don't speak regularly. A person who publicly speaks and records their ideas they really have it easy to write a book. Especially also if you teach in a pattern of what I call series. You know, like if you, if you teach a series. And by the way, what I do now, since I have been you know, in this business for a while, is I teach a series also with the book in mind. That's right. Mm -hmm. In other words, this will become a book when I'm finished. So I lay the whole series out and I actually lay the, the outline of the book as the series I'm going to teach. So that every time I finish the session, I know that, that those ideas, that the research is finished and everything else, to prepare the speaker's research. So when I'm finished the series, I got a book. I send it to the publisher. <laughs> they take what I recorded, they transcribe it, they organize it, they tweak it, we discuss it, we deal with that book finish. If you don't speak regularly, or if you're not a public speaker, you probably have to end up recording your ideas on a dictaphone or whatever you use, or you may need to do more of your own handwriting. Another way you can do it is to have someone ask you questions. For example, if you want to write a book, I don't know, what kind of subject do you like? I, I'm, I'm a mother of a disabled child. Okay, so mother of a disabled child. Great. Mother of a disabled child is good content. All right. So. Uh, what I would do is I would write a hundred questions that I want to know about this situation. I write a hundred questions. And then I would meet with her and we have a, re a recorder and I would just ask her the questions. And I write the questions in, in an order form that a person who don't know anything about that environment or that situation needs, wants to know. What does the market wants to know about a mother who has a disabled child from birth? If the child, let's say the child is 20 years or whatever, boy, what? That's a story. Okay. So I sit down, I say, all these other things. I list this whole list of questions, and I sit with her. I put a recorder on. She, she ain't got it right physically. I ask her questions, she answers every question, and every question is in sequence. She answers me, I record the answers. I'm getting a whole book. Sometimes you, you, you would see a book in the market that says, uh, this book is written by Hillary Clinton with. John Jones. Mm -hmm. It means John Jones sat with her. So his name goes on it as the one who kind of got the book out of her. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. So I can actually get a book out of you without you writing. I can make you talk. And sometimes that book is even more exciting than that, that way because I'm getting the real life response, mm -hmm. right? And guess what? It's your book. It ain't mine. Mm -hmm. It's your content. Right? And I would take what you recorded, and then I would transcribe it. Every word, transcribe it. Then I would organize, you know, and create, and get an editor to edit it, to turn it into, you know, a proper manuscript, and then send it back to you and say, read that. Is, is that what you told me? That's how you get a book out. Record it. Is this good? All right. Let's take a look at how 
we bring this to the end. Number, then this is number seven actually, write the content. Now this is tough for some of you who don't speak well, you gotta start writing. Now what's good about writing is once you get the outline already down, you start writing under each section what you want in that section. I'll show you that in a minute physically in one of my books. And then you create the manuscript. The manuscript is where you begin to, to complete everything, finish it as best you can. And then you have to review it for content and grammar and style and emotion and feeling. And is it you? Um, the author, I mean the editor who just did my book on kingdom citizenship, you know, I just sent a letter back to the publisher saying to them, the editor didn't do, didn't, didn't do a good enough job. So I got to write most of the book myself. So I've been working on the book myself. Uh, the editor didn't capture my Miles Monroe style. My style is very simple when you read my books, eh? And also, it feels like I'm having a conversation with you when you read my books, right? Uh, this, the editor didn't, didn't capture that. This is a new editor that they gave me. So I had to do most of the work myself. So you want to keep your style and your content. Then seek endorsement and forwards when you finish your manuscript. And by the way, you want to do this while you, your book like, is in that stage. Because by the time you're ready to publish it, you need to have your endorsements in hand, you need to have your forwards at least uh, agreed on. And you got to send the manuscript to the person you want to do an endorsement. An endorsement and a forward is different. A forward is someone who's going to give you an official uh, validation on the work. And that person is normally someone who people respect, who people would, would, would listen to, and that is what you ride on. You ride on their credibility. An endorsement is where you get comments from different people about the book, like the sentences that you can put, you know, to give the book credibility. But a, a, a foreword is different. A foreword can be, you know, three or four uh, paragraphs that the person writes on the book and tell you what they think about it and why people should read it. That's a foreword. All right. And then number five, uh, that's lady number 10, submit your manuscript. Now, this is interesting. Submit it to who is the question. Uh, if, you, if you have a manuscript and you're really new to the market, you don't, you don't know nobody, um, shop it around. In other words, you know, publishers receive manuscripts all the time. So sometimes they get sick of them. You know, they, people send manuscripts and suddenly you 3,000 manuscripts show up in a publisher's house in a month. How do you allow, how do you make a publisher take yours out of a pile of two, three hundred? That's the question. Well, a couple of ways. One, you got to know somebody like Miles Monroe. <laughs> you you got to know someone who know the publishers, who the publishers respect, someone who the publishers know have done well. Uh, publishers normally take recommendations for two reasons. One, if you are a successful author and you got a best-selling record, then you know what is good quality. You won't waste the publisher's time. So if you recommend a work to a publisher, the publisher will look at it out of the 300 that they got, if they got it from someone who they know. Uh, secondly, a second way to do it is you send your manuscript in a package, a neat package, but you put on the cover the title, the title, the working title of the book. Here's why. And put it in big, you know, put it in big letters. Because sometimes an author will be going through this, you know, this, just, be just kind of sifting through the stuff. And if the title jumps out, they'll stop. Your title is probably 90% of your sale. I don't care how good your content is. Your title could destroy it. So the title of a book has to be very carefully crafted. Under the title is what we call the subtitle. Mm -hmm. The subtitle is even more important than the title. Mm -hmm. The subtitle is the statement under the title that tells me what I will benefit if I read this book. That's what that subtitle is. I think I got some examples on all my books. All right, every book should have a subtitle there. Eh? This is your book. Okay. okay, authority is a title. But look at the words I use. 
power. You know, humans want power, so they, I use power a lot. Everybody want to be powerful, so I use power a lot. Okay, power and purpose. Everybody have purpose. Authority, man, that thing is powerful. People are buying it, okay? But look at the little, little thing on the bottom here. Discovering the power of your personal domain. You know, we have to debate that for like three weeks. Now, what's the best? How do I get someone to pick this up? People don't pick the book up because of the title. They pick it up because of the subtitle. Can you remember that? When they walk in the store and they see this on the shelf, the title draws them to the book. Authority. What makes them pick it up is the subtitle. Who's is this? Okay, yeah. All right. Here's one. The benefits, the principles and benefits of change. Very positive title. Subtitle, fulfilling your purpose in unsettled times. You know, things are changing. So get the subtitle, got to say, if you read this book, I'm going to show you how to fulfill your purpose in the middle of unsettled times. This one, overcoming crisis is the title. Hey, everybody want to know how to do that, man. How do I survive? Subtitles, secrets to thriving in challenging times. That's why they pick up the book. Are we good? Yep. So the title and the subtitle will either kill you or give you life. Mm. And that's what made the author, I mean the publisher pick up your book. Most of the time, they're looking for the title. Because they're looking for the market. You know, they, they've been going through all these manuscripts. They don't want to sit down and read 40 pages. You ain't gonna never get them to do that. You send them the title and the subtitle. Boom! They hit, the, hit them. Boom! They say, oh, this looks like something we can take a look at. Then they give it to the editor say, review that for us. The editor might say, the title is good, but the content is junk. Okay, throw it off. Or they might say, this content is good. Do so they give you a call back, send you uh, a contract? That's how you get a book out. Submit your title. And number six is the big one. Pray. <laughs> I know you all think this is, this is funny. Listen, let me say it again. A publishing company receives three to 4,000 manuscripts every month. They literally do. They just dump them. So you have to pray. You need God to intervene. If you got a content that you believe God told you to get to the market, get God involved. Get God involved. And God answered that in many different ways, you know. How he did it for me on a number of occasions. You, would, you might be speaking somewhere on the subject. Just speaking at a, at a seminar somewhere. And you never know who's sitting in the room. I told you that before. You never know who's sitting in any place. And in most cases, in my life, a publisher was sitting in the room. Or someone who knew a publisher was sitting in the room. And they came and says, that was awesome. I want to publish that. That's why you should take opportunities to talk about your ideas publicly. Because you never know who's around. You conjure up your ideas in your bedroom, and then you never let anybody know. But all of a sudden, you want to write a book. Ain't nobody know about your ideas. They don't know about them. And you can't, don't get mad if a publisher says, this is bad work or we're not interested in it. Don't get mad at them. They don't know you. So you got to pray for the Lord to intervene and, you know, let them miraculously pick yours up out of the 300 that day and say, uh, the Lord says, we must look at this one. God will do that. All right? Process of publishing. Coming down to the end. Publishing. There are a couple of ways to publish a book. First, you begin by accepting your status as a writer. What do I mean by that? Listen, nobody knows you. Okay, get over it. <laughs> Secondly, ain't nobody interested in what you're writing. Get over that, accept that. Thirdly, we don't even know where you came from. <laughs> All right, so you know, just be nice to yourself and don't set yourself up for disappointment. Your ideas are beautiful, they're powerful, the world needs them. The only problem is the publisher don't know you. Nobody knows you. So get over that. Number two, identify appropriate publishing companies. 
Now, appropriate means, look, don't send your book to uh, Aston Schuster or, you know, <laughs> don't send your book to a you know, big company down in New York and tell them, look, you know, you all didn't answer me back. <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> appropriate publishing company means you start with a company that may be in your neighborhood, a small one. Because let me tell you what happens in comp publishing companies. A publishing company, and this happened to me actually with my first book. The publishing company that published my first book <coughs> grew itself on my book. It was that small. They printed the book and they gave it to some other publishing companies to, to distribute. They were small because I didn't know them either. They didn't know me. And the, other, and the big companies began to realize that the book started selling. And then the book sold, you know, all these hundreds of thousands. And guess what happened? I started getting phone calls from all the publishing companies, the big ones. And I'm like, hey, 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 hey. You know, this is, but I started with a guy who could hardly pay me my royalties back. But the book hit the bestsellers list. And the big boys, see, let me tell you about publishing companies. They ain't interested in you. They're interested in their monies. Mm -hmm. exactly. Okay, get over that too. Mm -hmm. So don't take nothing personal. When they tell you this is garbage, don't take it personal. <laughs> <laughs> All right? They're interested in money. Period, period. But what happened is people. You know, he, he, people start buying the book. The big companies say, tell you what, we can give you a million dollars. The other fellow give you 30,000, we can give you a million. So you start with the guy in your neighborhood. Or go to the internet. Get a publishing company that at least get your book in print. You gotta pay for the copies yourself. Do it. Because here's what happens. If, if, you, if you publish a book, you pay for it by yourself and everything, and you publish, let's say, let's say you print 300 copies, you know, and you go to, you do a little speaking engagement and you sell it, you have no idea where the book is gonna end up. I've seen stories. So, some of my books end up that way. I, I got a publishing company now, man, it's a big deal, man. Ooh. I'm afraid to tell you what they paid me. Anyhow, you know, it ends up in people's hands. Get it out of you. Get it out of you. Don't try to become a best-selling book, you know, author like Miles Monroe. You can't do that. No one knows you. You just want to get it out. Deliver the baby. Why? Nobody knows you. And you get it out there, and you know what's going to happen? Them three, four hundred copies that you got printed, they can float around. Be floating. And then it comes into the hands of somebody who is a major publisher. And they say, hmm, wow. And then you get a phone call one day. And they'd say things like, would you like to consider republishing your book? That's a term they would use. In other words, can we take over this book? Your answer should not be a long answer. <laughs> Don't say you can fast and pray, but nothing. <laughs> Tell them yes first, and then wonder what did I say. Okay, yeah, you, you. But identify appropriate publishing companies. Some people, sometimes people say to me, say, Pastor Miles, can you send my, my book to your publisher? And I'm like, I, I can't do that. I can't just do that. Okay, I would say to you, you know, check out some other publishing companies first, or self-publish, which I'll talk about right now, yeah? Submit manuscript to many publishers. Ship it out, get the addresses, Send it to them. You can go on the internet, actually. One of my publishing companies, uh, you know, Whitaker House, you can go on there, and they have actually a place called New Authors. Click on that, they tell you what to do. You go to Destiny Image, click on, you know, they say New Publishers, New New Authors, click on it, tell you what to do. Okay? You go to Harper, you go to, you know, one of my big publishing companies now is Word, 
uh, word, word notes, they call it. Just click on, go, just go to the publishing company, click on it, they tell you what to do with new manuscripts. Just send it to them. And most of them are now electronic, so you, you don't actually know ship nothing physical. You can actually just shoot stuff out to 20 different publishers for review. Again, don't forget your title and your sub is the key. You want them to stop and look at yours. Okay. Accept and expect rejection. Say it. Okay, this will keep your blood pressure down and you won't get mad at the world for no reason. They may reject your manuscript over and over again. That's all right. You know, someone out there is going gonna, is gonna to bite. So don't take it personal. Next, consider self-publishing. If, while you are fishing out there, you might want to self-publish. Self-publish, and I'll explain exactly what that means in a minute, uh, is when you actually publish it yourself. Then be willing to pay the price for self-publishing. And then you must consider yourself as a distributor. Self-distribution is where you distribute your book yourself as best you can, which means that you may, if you have engagements of speaking at different places, you know, you bring your books, you, you know, you kind of distribute that way, or you can send your books, free copies to certain people, you know, well-known people, so they can see your content. For example, a lot of my speaking engagement comes from my books. People will read a book and say, I want this guy to come in and speak on this. So you get a mailing list of people, you know, all the pastors in the city, maybe all the, you know, the, the youth groups or whatever, and you send your books out there, whatever your subject is, you send it out there. And people are going to start calling you and say, look, I like this. Can you come and speak on this? And what you're doing is you're creating distribution systems. Because now you go to speak, there are 40 people in the room. You, you know, you take 40 books and you say, look, you know, uh, I got a special on books today. I'm going to speak on this. People buy the books. And every book, write this down, every book passes through seven hands. That's the average they've, they have discovered. Every book passes through how many hands? Seven. seven. So if you have 10 books, 70 people potentially would be exposed to those books. If you get 700 books, that's 490, 4,900 people will see those books. So don't just think of the one book. Think of the seven people that's going to touch this book. They're going to look at it. And one of them might be, you know, a big boy. And that's how you move around. So self-publishing is important, and self-distribution is also important. Let's talk about self-publishing for a minute. But this might be your first option. Self-publishing has some pro and cons. Let me give you the pro and cons. One, when you self-publish, you control the process completely. You control the quality of the manuscript. You can get help if you want, of course. You know, get editors to help you clean your manuscript up grammatically, you know, syntax, context, all those things. You need someone to help you make sure you get something that is palatable to the marketplace. And can I use the term, here's a term to remember, industry standard. Yeah. What did I say? Industry standard. Write that down and remember that. Because if you don't come up to industry standard, the industry ain't going to suck you in. They're going to spit you out. So you want to control the process but also make sure that it's professional enough that the industry would be interested in it. Self-publishing also means that you control the cost. That means you control how much you're willing to pay to get it published. Thirdly, you control distribution. That means that you got to distribute it yourself or you got to find a shop it around to get distributed, a distribution. For example, you may publish a book and you may know some people down at the grocery store, the manager, you say, look, uh, you're my friend, can I have a little space in your bookstore at the cut cashier, you know, just kind of put my books there and whatever is sold, we give you 5% or 10%. You know, you go to a drugstore and say, look, you know, I'm going to talk to the, to the, the manager. In other words, you, you, you can become your own distributed, you know, machine by building up relationships with people. You can go to the church and say, look, uh, I have some books here and I'd like to put this in your bookstore on consignment. Whatever we sell, you get 40%. And they say, okay, yeah, put your book in that book. In other words, they, the guy like I said, yeah, it's a pretty good book, sure. So what you're doing is you're distributing relationships mm -hmm. yourself. You clear? Okay. That can work, believe me. A lot of people distribute books that way through relationships. Control distribution. 
When you self-publish, you also control sales. You control how much books are, are sold. Because you control how many books are printed. You also control the price. If you self-publish, you know how much you paid for it. So you can create your own price points. Self-publishing, you know, a, a book may cost four bucks to get it published. You can sell it for $10, or you can sell it for $8, but you control what you sell it for. You, 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 are, the, you are the source, you're the producer. You also control promotion. You can decide, uh, and by the way, with the internet today, boy, I tell you what, you can really do good on this. You can develop your own website for your book. Just one website for your book. And you can develop a whole series of books on that one website. Mm -hmm. And then you can actually e-blast that. And then you can promote your books on some of the e-blast uh, companies that you see on the website. You know, these, you know, Gospel Today, all this stuff. You look, I have a book, you pay a couple of dollars, sh they shoot it to 100,000 people, books available. So you can actually market your own product today with the, the website it makes it unlimited. All right. Uh, it's, it's really better too now because years gone by, you had to depend on the publishing companies and distributors to market your books. But with the, with the, with the website, you become your own marketing genius. Mm -hmm. And you can actually tag on different people. For example, you say, Pastor Miles, you know, uh, I'm one of your mentees. Hey, smile. Okay, so you say, Pastor Miles, I'd like to you know, uh, uh, ask you to put my book on, on your website. Well, I think it's a good book. I say, sure. And my name, if I, if I do endorsement on it, that's even better. You know, I put it on my website. People go looking for me, and they see you. You know, you get five million hits. They go, oh, wow. You know, this. And they may not want me. They may want the subject you wrote on. You understand? They see my name. They say, oh, what? But they say, Pastor Miles, have a book. You know, he endorsed a book on, you know, uh, how to deal with a child with handicap or something. And they say, wow, I got a handicapped kid. So they click on that book and they buy your book. See, so you can distribute market many different ways by networking. You know, uh, big companies uh, buy my book by the thousands. You know, the book, they have a company called Monovi. Monovi. You know, they use my, my books, my market, my leadership books. They buy 10,000, give to all the distributors. You know, and they put it in their magazines. I don't know about that. They, they market my stuff for me. So, you know, you, you, you network to get your book out, all right? And then when you self-publish, you also control advertising. You can actually go to the local newspaper and advertise your book in the papers. It's a brand new release, da 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 This will do this and do this, do this for you. This will help you this way, you know, and put a book, picture of the book in the, in the newspaper. Or you can use a electronic distribution uh, to advertise. All right. What's the pro and con for publishing at a publishing company? This is a tough one. What's good about a publishing company, publishing your book, is that they bring into play professional writers. So, <laughs> now this is when the company chooses you. Self-publishing is you actually do it yourself. Publishing companies will provide professional writers. Secondly, they provide and produce professional manuscripts. That's what they want. It's industry standard. Thirdly, they will control the design of the book. That means the cover. You know, most of my covers, I collaborate with them because I'm an artist myself. I have a degree in art, so I know what I want. But they would always you know, work with me on that because they have their own artists as well, their own graphics people. And they normally would design a book based on what the market is after at the moment. You know, like this book, they would call this a, a bar design book with bars. And that's what the market likes right now. So, you know, people pick those books. It's more, it's more uh, what they call a corporate look. Okay, corporate look. Uh, so they would design your covers and everything else, your back text. They also provide professional distribution systems. The way the, 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 way the companies work is uh, the publishing company is normally connected to a distribution company. They're two different activities. Publishing is not automatically distribution. So if a publisher takes your book, it doesn't mean he's going to distribute it. Distribution is the key to a successful author. Because if you can't get your books to the market, no one will buy them. 
So what's the pro of a publishing company is that they already have the distribution process. Number five, professional promotion and advertising. They provide their own uh, magazines, their electronic magazines, they have their catalogs, they, uh, they have what they call their advertising agencies. They also have links to all the bookstores. For example, uh, this, this is a good time to tell you about this. The book I'm writing on right now, uh, Kingdom Citizenship, the book is not complete, completed yet, but they've already started preparing for promotional advertising. And what they're doing is behind the scenes work. They are sending personal information to the buyers right now saying, Dr. Miles Monroe is about to release a new book. They're telling them that right now. The book ain't finished yet, but they're already telling them. The book is about this and this and this and this. They're gonna position it this way in the market. Prepare for this book. So they already started promoting. When the book is just about finished, they go to another level and they say to the bookstores, they press a button and 30,000 bookstores right away get this announcement, Monroe book to be released in 30 days, 30,000 bookstores. So the bookstores already know my name. They say, okay, yeah, this guy, we, we, we sell a lot of his stuff. We even ain't gonna wonder about this book. We want you know, a thousand copies. So 30,000 books by, 30,000 bookstores by a thousand copies. How much that is, three million? Yeah, so that's how the system works. They, they got it already worked out. You press a button. That's the advantage of a publishing company. You're not there yet. You want to get there. The way you get into a big publishing company is that you got to hit one good one first. Publishing companies don't experiment with, with authors. <laughs> they just want money. Now, they will take a chance once in a while. For example, let's say you are an athlete and everybody knows you. You retire, you write your story. They can take a chance with you because you already promoted. It's called pre-promotion, pre-exposure. Let's say if you are a, a woman who has a, a woman's network, you got 300,000 women in your network on your, you know, and you do women speaking. They say, you know something, no one knows you, but you got 3,000 people, 300,000 people, man. We, you, you're good for us. Mm -hmm. If you sell 10%, you're okay with us. Mm -hmm. So they'll, give, they, they'll pay you to write. Or they'll let you pay 50%, they pay 50%. In other words, they already know that you got promotional advertising power. If you're a pastor, your church is, you know, 3,000 members, they'll say, yeah, let's talk, because we got a market that's controlled by you already. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But here you go, you ain't got nothing. You got a partner pan of TV. <laughs> <laughs> and you say, this is a good book. Take a chance on me. They're like, really? Uh, <laughs> okay? So, uh, they, that, that's what they are. They're interested in getting their money back. They're going to invest money. They want it back. They want more than they invested too, believe me. They want more. All right. Next, companies have preset credibility. What does that mean? A publishing company has a name. It's Whitaker House. Whitaker House is well known all over the world. Whitaker House is the largest distributor. They have a company called Anchor Distributors. And Whitaker House has been known for many years to being one of the top companies. So when they put their logo on my book, immediately the bookstores respect it. So they have what I call preset credibility. Okay? If you, if, if you go to the internet, and you get a publishing company from the internet, right? It's, a, it's not a well-known publishing company in the, in the market. So they put their logo on your book, you know, logo. The companies don't know that, that company too well. Publishing, you know, the distributors don't know that company too well. They say, oh, you know. So you might not hit the major distributors yet, okay? So it's not preset credibility. Now, some internet bookstores, uh, publishing companies are becoming very, very impressive. And so now the big companies are also looking at them and picking up some of their books. Be willing to pay the cost. You can take your book to a publishing company. The publishing company will say, okay, I will publish your book. But they'll say to you, uh, you gotta pay for it. Now, publishing companies may have more than one 
uh, what they call uh, brand name, brands, brands, sorry, you know, label, brands, labels. And they, they do that for certain reasons. For example, you can go to a public company, they have like four different brands. And there's one brand that is for professional best-selling authors. They ain't gonna put you on that label. They may give you the first or second, second or third one. They say, we can put you here, all right? And they say, but now you gotta pay. So let's say for 3,000 books, you gotta pay $10,000. That's for the whole process. You give me $10,000, I can give you 3,000 books. You know, printed, bound, finished in a box. $10,000. So you, come, you get your $10,000, you tell them, here's my manuscript. They will review it, make sure, you know, it's quality, because their name's going on it. And then they say, you know, you pay, we give you the books. Us publishing companies will do that if you publish with them. You gotta pay the cost. <coughs> this is the biggest one. Be willing to submit to their royalty standards. Uh, Again, people don't, you know, think of money when they think of writing. Don't think of money first. Money comes later. You won't think of exposure first. You won't get to the market. So, a publishing company may say to you, okay, uh, we're going to publish your book for you, right? You give me $10,000, we can publish your books, we can give you 3,000 books. You got to sell them yourself. But they might say, but, but we, we like your book, so we can put it in our catalog. Okay, and that's part of the ten thousand dollars. Yeah, we put in our catalog, we expose it through our system. We may even offer it to the, offer it to the bookstores. See what they say. But as part of it, you know, you can negotiate that with them with that ten thousand. Mm -hmm. Then they may say to you, uh, whatever we sell, we can give you five percent royalty. Now you are unknown. <coughs> it's the first time you wrote, and they really putting their label on your name. So you might say to them, okay, 5%. You know, sometimes people get excited and go, I want 10%, and I work hard. No, no. <laughs> they taking a chance on you too. They putting their name with your name. 5%. See, if you know you're good, and you know you got more books inside, let them take the first 5%. That's my secret. My secret is, I got them. I got 40 books in my storehouse in the Bahamas still that I even write. I got 40 books. So, you know, I tell them, all right, when you remember me first started, the brothers say 12%. I say, okay, 12%, brother. I, I'm not an author. I don't know anything, but this, 12%. I didn't know he was robbing me at the time, but you know, I just. <laughs> but when that book hit, bam, half a million, I said, they start calling me. I say, now we can talk. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I'm from the Bahamas. I'm a crazy man. <laughs> you don't want me because it's talk business, boy. <laughs> and they say, 50? Mm -mm, brother, I'm 18. 18, call me tomorrow. Yeah. 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 Now I'm at the point where I tell them what I want. Mm -hmm. So if you're just entering the market, don't fuss about royalties at this point. Mm -hmm. You're just happy that they got you out there now. You're in the, you're in the market. Mm -hmm. You're going to get exposure first. Mm -hmm. okay. And if your work is good and people begin to buy it, then you began to have power to negotiate your next project. Thank you once again for listening to this message as we hope that it has been a blessing to you. Our goal is to show you new paths and opportunities so that you can discover your purpose. It is your love, support, and partnership that makes Monroe Global possible. Please visit us online at www.monroeglobal.com for more product, partnership, or to join us at one of our live events around the world.